from admiring Western brands right up to um, incorporating a lot of Chinese culture and design into their creative campaigns that just speak to local audiences. I'm a mother, I am a wife, and I'm an entrepreneur. Gosh, why am I doing this? The first time I came out without a business card and that really made me nervous. COVID has been really weird buzzword is digital, getting people into physical spaces. Go out, smell the roses, take some time out. Natalie, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it's a rainy day, but I'm sure we're going to have a lot of fun. On your LinkedIn, you wrote that you wear lots of hats. So what yes. are those hats? Oh my God. And what is uh, high on the list of your priority You want the list? official hats or you want <laughs> All hats. Um, yeah, so I'm a mother, I am a wife, and I'm an entrepreneur. Um, but at the same time, obviously, um, daughter, um, friend, um, and also I love giving back to the business community and global community. So I also um, partner with and volunteer with um, other associations and I mentor and coach um, women professionals and, and professionals and, and entrepreneurs. So all of that kind of... What uh, comes first in the priority? What's more important for you? Which one you're going to... Um, take off if, if it's not important. Definitely being a mother and my family because I think um, the reason why we started the Orange Blowfish was really to build something that we love but also have the flexibility where I could put priority in my family and my kids. Um, so being a mother is definitely number one because they need me. Um, I need to be there for them um, personally, um, you know, during their personal growth and what's happening at school and and I love hearing all the crazy stories after school coming back and even in the evenings like no matter what I, I definitely do try to go home put them to sleep um, have to spend that 20 minutes with them just to hear what's going on I mean our kids are nine and six so they're at the point where they're making new friends they're developing their own personality so and they say some really really funny stuff so definitely being a mom first um, wife comes hand in hand but as you know Sue and I work together <laughs> so we see each other every day and I've, I'm very lucky to have um, a husband who's also my business partner so he has my back in life he has my back in business so you know for us we kind of take that for granted um, to work and to work together and spend that time together um, you know every day and then being an entrepreneur because obviously without my family we wouldn't be here where we are today that's super exciting so you have lots of these activities. You're also a member of different organizations, like yeah. you mentioned, right? You're also a coach, you're a mentor, you, you run the business, you have the family. I'm just curious, because I also <laughs> run in the company. I don't have the family yet, I mean, with the kids. And I already can't find time for anything else. Where do you find time? And where do you get this motivation to keep it running, keep it going? Yeah, I think every day is a struggle. I, I, I just think that it makes it harder and, uh, much, and, and much more of a balancing act for somebody who has my lifestyle. I think there's only 24 hours in a day and right. you want to do so much, whether you have kids or not, I'm sure everybody has their own priorities. So for me, it's making sure that I remain true to why I did this in the first place. I mean, it's so funny because if we would have done this interview like two weeks ago, I would have like thrown in my towel and like, I hate my life and everything. And I have moments like that. Um, but I think it's it, it's good to um, re remind yourself as to why you did this in the first place. Um, and I was killing myself over work and, and, and family and, and thinking, gosh, why am I doing this? Like, you know, I'm, I'm just so tired all the time. And I started waking up at 5, 5.30. I wasn't sleeping till 12 oh midnight. God. And I'm trying to do, like, be there for everybody. I mean, we've all been through that, right? And I think um, a couple of weeks ago, I had this chat with Sue, actually, my husband and also my business partner. And I just said, look, I'm just gonna take some time out and um, reorganize my life and restructure what is true to me, um, what's important to me and my family. And I did that. And so I think it's, I think 
it's understanding that you can't have everything now you can't be everything now so on days I'm more of a mother um, I, I mean you never like stop being a mother but I spend more time with my kids mm. and on other days like today um, I won't see my kids tonight because I've got work events and other stuff so I think it's having that flexibility to know that you know you can't be equally spread out to all your different parties every single day mm -hmm. so I plan um, I I'm quite crazy at scheduling, so I plan my week, um, actually not my week, my month in advance. Wow. So I know my friends absolutely hate it. <laughs> the joke is you have to book Nat four to six weeks in <laughs> advance. Um, but it is because I, I try to be there for um, everybody who, who, who's really important mm -hmm. in my life. And, and that's my team. That's, you know, my husband as a business partner and my life partner. It's my close girlfriends. It's my business community who has supported the Orange Blowfish. It's my mentors. It's my coach. Like, it is quite crazy when you break it down like that. And then my kids, you know. Um, so I do try to make time for everybody, but it it does kind of take a toll on you in a way. But you've just got to prioritize that, um, no matter what. Priority and scheduling, right? So this is super helpful. Um, you spent eight years with United Technologies in yeah. Singapore. Eight yeah. years sounds like a long time. Oh my God. It, uh, I, I think it was a great time right, for you. Can you talk a little bit about that and why did you eventually decide to leave the company? Sure. Um, United Technologies was an amazing firm. I love it. It's now um, Raytheon Technologies. And when I joined, um, they hired me straight out of Australia. Um, to sell engines back to an Australian airline. I don't come from an engineering background. Um, for some reason, they needed somebody who um, understood Chinese culture. Um, well, at the time it was Singapore, so Asian culture, so to speak, um, but understood Australia as well. So they hired me straight out of Australia and put me in Singapore. But then mm. I was selling back to Australian companies anyway. I loved it. I was, you know, 22 at the time. Um, you know, I was learning a new skill. I got to, I, I love traveling. So I worked for this um, OEM, so engine manufacturer, um, and I got to see the cockpit. I got to see how an engine works. It was so fascinating. And they flew me all over the world. Um, it was great. Time really flew. And I moved from place to place. So I landed in Singapore and then I got a job in Hong Kong and then eventually I landed in Shanghai with the same company. So mm. it, it, it was just one of those roles and companies that really valued, um, I guess, what they call um, high performing employees. And I got so many different assignment opportunities. I worked in Turkey, I worked in Canada, I worked in the US and, and every two years they would s like switch it up for me. So it was really fun, I loved it. Um, the reason why I left to be honest was I, had a personal crisis um, in my life. One of my closest friends passed away from cancer um, within 10 days. And I think that just shook me. Um, I was just in, I think I just turned 30 or close to 30. And I'd been with this company for eight years. Um, as you know, I was born and raised in Australia. And so I'd spent, you know, since 1999 away from home. And it really made me think what I was living for was I living for this job that was really high flying and amazing um, like what was I doing and I think it was the first time that I really sat down and and um, asked myself what I wanted and I didn't have an answer mm -hmm. and I went through this um, dep um, depressing state to figure things out and my boss said to me and, and this is why I love the company so much because I had such amazing bosses and he said to me Nat you're really not in the right zone um, you know, do you need coaching? Do you need therapy? What can I do to help? And in the end, I said, like, I, I don't know what I want to do. I'm not giving my 100% to anything. And I, I think I should leave the company. And he offered me a six month sabbatical mm -hmm. and said, look, you know, I, I, I don't want you to leave, but why don't you just take time out and we'll keep your job for you when, when you're ready, just come back. Um, and it was just amazing. Um, and so I took the six months off. They offered me a job in the US um, and I just couldn't go back. And that was my journey to where we are today. Interesting. Well, this is definitely a life changing experience, right? For you working for that company, yeah. with that boss. Um, 
also on LinkedIn, I found that you are the personal branding strategist. And mm -hmm. uh, personal branding is something that actually I'm also kind of uh, always interested in. Um, so what is personal branding for you? How does it help you um, as, as the business owner? Um, yeah. Is it important for equally for employees and for entrepreneurs? Just to tell a bit more about the personal branding. Yeah, so personal branding is something that I went to understand a little bit more when I left United Technologies. I think everybody has this personal identity attached to their career or attached to their job or attached to something that they do in society. And that was definitely where I was back in, you know, 2009, 2010, after I just left United. Um, and so... I had decided um, after I left my corporate career that I was going to do everything under the sun that I wanted to do um, without giving a care in the world as to how much it earns. So I became a makeup artist, I became a trainer, I was an executive coach and I did a lot of different learnings in, in the two years that I gave myself. Mm -hmm. But the first time I came out without a business card. To, with a reputable company because mm. you know, at the time the company I worked for was um, listed number 30 on Fortune 500. So I didn't even have to sell myself. They were just like, oh, hey, Nat, you know, whatever. Um, and then I realized that I came out and I was introducing myself at these networking events as Natalie Lowe. For the very first time, I wasn't attached to a company and that really made me nervous. <laughs> I mean, it really did. I didn't know what to say. You know, I had been with this firm for such a long time and Obviously, um, a, a successful employee or a professional at that matter, I had like 10 plus years experience, you know, but I was so self-doubting myself, like, and I started to think what was wrong with me. And so I went and did a personal branding course to try and help me come out of my shell because I didn't have a link, I didn't have a proper LinkedIn profile. Um, back then we were still using paper, so I had like um, a very updated CV, but no one knew about me. And what I wanted to do was develop um, myself as a consultant. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I had to shake off my aerospace career and my corporate career and build myself as Natalie Lowe, whatever that would be. So I think personal branding helps you better understand what your core values are as an individual and how you can relate that and promote that or communicate that to your audience um, in a professional way. So with personal branding, I learned about my how to do my elevator pitch. I learned about um, you know how social is really important right now because we were at that time when we were transforming and social was playing a very um, important part to professional careers and stuff. Um, I learned um, about how to be authentic and, and be true to yourself and, and it gave me quite a number of tools that I would use on a regular basis um, that I don't even know that I'm, that, that was really handy. And, and I think, to be honest, we were all doing that, but personal branding just helped you give those steps. It's like going to the gym and learning, you know, how to do personal training. The pers you, you know you're doing it, but the personal trainer is just most probably finessing right. your your position or something. That's what pers like I think personal strategy um, helped me um, and in, in me promoting or communicating what I do as an individual. Interesting. Yeah, this is definitely the big topic and I think now in the world where we have the social medias and uh, we have pretty much globalization, right? And uh, um, there are lots of people doing similar things. Yeah. And how do you stand out? Yeah. Uh, I think it's more about uh, now people who you know, right? Not who, people who are the best in, in their fields, because probably the best ones in their fields, you, you will never find out about them. Um, so personal branding helps just stand out a little bit and then probably it helps you to, to go a little bit further. It uh, does. I think also um, your own personal reputation, because as an entrepreneur, people will buy your service or use your product or service because they like you. Yeah. They like you as an individual. They, they've heard good stuff about you. And yeah, it comes with the perks of um, whatever you do, but they will approach you because of you. And then I think that's already a very good personal brand there because it says a lot about you. But I also think it goes back to making your first impressions mm -hmm. count. Right. So it's all about, you know, the, the relationship can take you to a certain can open doors. It's whether you're able to walk in that door mm. and close it. Right. So I think these connections definitely get us somewhere, but it's your own personal value, your core as an individual 
as well as what you can offer and what people are saying about you is that first impression of validation whether what people are saying about you is actually true when you meet somebody mm -hmm. and then it's the delivery so it is the whole package of of validating what people say you are or who you are and as an entrepreneur and especially in china like it's highly competitive everybody's trying to get it's out there and you know how many videos do we have or how many you know linkedin posts we have of pretty much sharing the same thing it's it's a little bit of an information overload so i think it's back to basics as to be yourself be authentic stand by what you believe in and whatever is happening or not happening is is for a reason but good things will come to the end of it and and be true to yourself that's what's really really important and to your business tell me more about the your current company current uh, baby right the the orange blow fish <laughs> yes. what do you do there um, what the company does and what makes this company successful because um, it has a, actually a very good reputation. I've seen it also Aww. from time to time on LinkedIn, on WeChat. People give the good feedback. So I'm just curious to know more about the company. Well, thank you. The Orange Bluefish, we're a creative branding agency and we make a difference leveraging storytelling, art, space and technology um, and pushing creative boundaries to help brands come up with a solution. So whether it be a new product launch, whether it be a new bar or space, or, you know, it's getting more sales um, for, for a product idea, um, we do all that. So we have no boundaries in what we do, but we did start off in street art. So Seal, my husband and um, our, my business partner, um, quit his full-time job in his mid thirties as a headhunter and took a couple of um, lessons from a few friends in um, Morganshan. They were strangers at the time, but they're really good friends now. Um, and then that was the beginning of the Orange Blowfish. Um, it was just that idea that we can make this city a better place and add a bit of color and spice because back in 2010 when we started, I'm um, sorry, in 2012 we started, um, we realized that everything was going digital. And there was not that human element of touch a feel of um, you know smell and everything that you saw was on WeChat everything that you received was digital and electronic and so Seal has always had a, a passion in art and he decided that he was just going to give it this try to, to see what he can do so we started off in street art graffiti and um, we did commune on Taikong Road and then did a couple of other commission projects and the and our first branding and an actual um, environmental graphic design project was Liquid Laundry out at mm -hmm. Dunkle Road. So we're very well known for our spatial design. Um, so if you know the Broken Dagger, Up Shanghai, um, Zodiac, um, we did a lot of their consumer touch points and brand experience and, and, and spatial branding. Um, and then we've slowly moved into a, a lot of other different work from digital to brand strategy to logo design and we just do the whole shebang now so from an idea concept um, right up to the execution the activation and and the realization of a brand so you already uh, started talking a little bit about the creative industry right and you mentioned that before you realized that it's going to be digital so if you can describe quickly briefly um, creative industry in China 10 years ago now and where is all heading? What are the trends now? Well, let's just talk about before COVID and after COVID because <laughs> I think that's already changed a lot. Um, I think COVID has been really weird um, and, and I guess an enabler of China moving forward with um, especially Chinese youth um, from admiring Western brands right up to um, incorporating a lot of Chinese culture and design into their creative campaigns that just speak to local audiences. Mm -hmm. I think that's been such a huge shift in, in the way that we work. I mean, I think um, even before COVID, we were maybe, I would say, you know, leaning heavier towards Western brands. And now I would say the, the biggest majority of our clientele is local brands. Even big brands um, have local teams. 
So even for us, we're shifting in how we adapt international creativity mm -hmm. with local, um, local heritage, local design, in order to speak to a local audience because you know, national wave in, mm -hmm. in that, that's really prevalent mm -hmm. in when we speak to clients today. It's not how can you, maybe a few years ago it was how can you make me more international. Now it's how do you make me more modern so the Chinese youth will follow or buy my product. That's really the conversations that we're having today. So what we're finding is where, where Western um, creative designs or even creativity has been more minimalist, more mm -hmm. functional, more practical. Mm -hmm. You know, the Chinese culture has been more intricate, more delicate, more, um, you know, historical in nature. So it's finding that balancing act between those two um, when it comes to producing creative solutions and also creative designs. And then we're also looking at online and offline. Um, you know, pre-COVID, everybody's like, I've got to be on digital. I have to be on digital. So we're always thinking about campaigns that go on digital. After COVID, everybody's been locked up and all they want to do is come out. So now there's a new term called fidgetal, which is how do you get people into physical spaces and then drive the traffic online? So before it was online to offline, O2O, that was most probably the biggest trend, um, you know, jargon back in pre-COVID. Now the biggest buzzword is digital, getting people into physical spaces and then looking at how online can extend that connection. So mm -hmm. we're thinking about that as well. So definitely creativity has, has just even in China shifted when we're talking about the last 18 months, 10 years ago. I mean, I can't even remember what happened with COVID before. Yeah, it's crazy. That's really uh, in insightful information. Uh, we also have lots of challenges to bring people back to the events because we do lots of events and we did before COVID, so it was easy to get people um, to the venue. So now it's getting really harder. And um, I don't know what, what's the change exactly, but um, yeah. it's a struggle to bring people to offline events. Yeah, I think right now people, there was this period after COVID, um, people were just dying to get out, right? Because they had been stuck at home for at least three months, you know, places are small. And at the end of the day, we're humans. We need human interaction. But now what we're seeing is an overload and an overwhelming of events. So it's how do you get your event out there? And I think it's quality, not over quantity for anybody. Mm. It's definitely quality, not quantity. On one particular evening, you can have three or four events happening. Um, and it's how do you pick what that event is? And I think if you're able for anybody if you're able to get even a lower number or a smaller number of followers who are true and can really engage your community and be a part of that and be brand ambassadors for that community that will slowly grow um, and that's what we're starting to see is before a lot of brands maybe pre-covid were doing really really well with the quantity mm. of um, certain products or mm. even certain launches that right now customers are being more or consumers are being more selective in how they spend their money mm -hmm. where are they going mm. who are they spending it with it's definitely down to the brand core of does your brand resonate with their value interesting and before i drive you to the next meeting i have the last question uh, for uh, fellow entrepreneurs like like me and many others who, who will be watching and listening what would be your top advice uh, what uh, are your top learnings that you acquired during this years of running your own business? A couple yeah. of things to uh, pay attention to. Yeah, I, I would say the first thing is um, keep on at it, never give up, um, because I think you have to believe in what, what you're doing, what you're building. You chose to be an entre entrepreneur for a reason, and there is no backup this is it so continue at it um, and believe that something good will come out of it and, and, and it'll only get better from here and number two is is know that you can't do this alone as an entrepreneur doesn't mean working alone entrepreneur means building something you believe in living the lifestyle that you want and doing the things that you love that doesn't mean killing yourself over it and doing everything yourself and and um, you know not entrusting your team to be able to be an entrepreneur is to build that team who has your back and letting go 
Um, don't sweat the small stuff, which is something that I'm still learning right now. Definitely don't sweat the small stuff. Um, coach your team members, build them up to be smarter than you because that's what you want because you want your legacy to live on. You, you know, it's not about, yeah, definitely it's about the founder, but if for the legacy to live on, it's got to be more than that. So how are you going to grow? How are you going to continue to be around or your, or your legacy for the next 10, 20, 30 years? And that's where we're at right now. Um, you know, Sue is definitely the founder and the executive creative director. Um, you know, we're 10 years next year. Our next step is, okay, what is next? How are we going to continue growing that? Um, spirit that he's brought into the company and that culture and that attitude into um, what the orange blowfish might be the next 10 years and um, have fun you know I think one thing that I've learned from you know my two weeks of um, taking time out is never lose sight of why you did this in the first place have fun like when it becomes a job that's the end um, you know go out smell the roses take some time out you know don't answer that email, don't answer that WeChat straight away. It, it, things can wait, it's not going to burn down. So definitely have some fun and give yourself some space to, ha to go and have that fun, yeah. Love it, golden tips. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. I wish good luck to, to you uh, and also the company. Uh, so you, you mentioned it's going to be 10 years anniversary very soon. So uh, hope it's going to be a big party and celebration. Uh, I would love to join. And of course, I want to see more and more uh, creative projects that run by your company in, in Shanghai and beyond. Thank you so much. That was uh, another episode in China Between Meetings with Natalie Lowe. Please like, comment and share and see you next time. Yay! Thank you for having me.